San Francisco Bay Area welcomes you. Huge welcome. Did you see the lobster? I do. I did. did. I said the lobster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lobsters everywhere. I guess they just made a lobster emoji. Uh, that seems synchronous, right? Seems like a synchronous event. It's quite funny. I, I want the one where you're riding the lobster. Yeah, that well, one. you can buy those posters if you're really into that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> New fetishes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jordan, where do we even start? Well, you're the interviewer. You <laughs> Amazing. Amazing work over the last year. Uh, you, for me, Someone that you remind me of is Tony Robbins. I think he's taller. <laughs> uh, s s someone that knows how to inspire people to self-actualization. And I find that to be deeply needed in our world, and that's what you've been doing. And it's brilliant. It's beautiful. And I think this is why you bring people together like this. So, so something that you brought to the attention of so many people is the dominance or competence hierarchy. Why, what, can, let's maybe talk about what's, what's the difference, dominance or competence hierarchy. I kind of like competence hierarchy. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Yeah, well, I got this colleague, his name is Daniel Higgins, and I've been working with him for like 25 years. He helped me design the self-authoring suite. Um, which is a series of programs, writing programs that are online that help people uh, write about their lives, their past and their present, their virtues and their faults, and to make a plan for the future. And um, We've talked a lot. He, he, was a, he has a master's degree in MIT in engineering, and then he went to Harvard. He was a student of mine there, and he got a PhD in experimental psychology. And We've been working on these psychological interventions online ever since, and we talk fairly frequently, and I'd been using the term dominance hierarchy a lot, which it's something that's used by biologists very regularly, right? Because most social animals, even animals that aren't social, any animals that have to compete for occupation of a specific territorial space tend to organize themselves into fairly predictable hierarchies. And it's, it's, it's a biological universal. That's a good way of thinking about it which is something really important to know, right? Because if you don't know that, then you might think that hierarchical organizations are some secondary consequence of a socio-political structure or an economic structure or something like that, and it's just, that's just not true. It isn't even a little bit true. It's unbelievably not true. And, well, um, this is partly why in, in, rule, in 12 Rules for Life, I wrote about the nervous system of crustaceans in, in rule number one, because the neurobiological systems that we have evolved, or that have evolved, to deal with dominance hierarchy placement, I'll get to the competence issue in a minute, are at least a third of a billion years old. And that's far longer than there's, that's, that's, there weren't trees a third of a billion years ago. So dominance hierarchies, hierarchical organizations among animals are older than trees. It's like, there's no blaming them on capitalism, right? This is, it's just, well, seriously, hierarchies have problems. They're problematic social structures, but, you can't blame them on, 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 on cultural. You can't blame them on culture. Anyways, we were talking about dominance hierarchies, and Dr. Higgins said, you can't call them dominance hierarchies. I said, why not? I said, he said, well, unless you're in an organization where you can put a dog leash around someone's neck and lead them around, it's not a dominance hierarchy. And I thought, he's kind of blunt, as you might have noticed by that comment. Kind of shocked me, eh? Because because it was so blunt. There's lots low. of that that happens in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, the thing is, well, you know, that, that's actually an apropos comment because dominance is just as old as sexuality, perhaps. Perhaps not quite as old. It's not quite as old as sexuality, but it's old enough so that the two things get tangled together very, very inevitably. So he said... He said two things that I thought were really interesting, and, and the first was that um, human organizations are sufficiently complex so that dominance is an insufficient means of establishing hierarchical priority. I thought, that's good, and I thought, that's right, I knew that. As soon as he said that, I thought, yeah, I shouldn't be using the term dominance hierarchy, because Franz de Waal, who's a, a Dutch primatologist, 
wrote a a series of excellent books on the emergence of morality in chimpanzees. I would highly recommend them. They're very interesting books. One of the things DeWall noted was that in chimpanzee hierarchies, the brutal males can rise to the top, but they tend to have very short-lived empires and to meet very, very violent deaths. And so his, his conclusion was that in order even for a chimpanzee hierarchy to be stable across time, then the top chimp had to be quite pro-social. So first of all, had to engage in sufficient reciprocal behavior so that he had allies among other males, right? Because otherwise, if you're like top chimp and you're caveman, strongman type, and, and you've established your dominance merely as a matter of intimidation and strength, then if you have an off day, two of your slightly weaker opponents can tear you to pieces, which is exactly what the chimps do because they're quite brutal in there. There's no evidence that chimpanzees have any internal regulation of the violence that they'll use to shift dominance hierarchy position. And so you end up castrated, for example, by your opponents, which is something that DeWall noted in the Arnhem Zoo. So he found that the stable chimp troops had males at the helm who, were, who had friendships, because chimps actually have social friendships, really, that, that can stretch across many years, decades even, and that they track them very well, very reciprocal in their behavior, tended to treat the females relatively well by chimp standards, and also tended to pay a fair, a fair amount of attention to the infants, which is an unbelievably important finding, right? Because it, it indicates at a, at a level that's below the human, let's say, that there's an ethic associated with leadership that isn't a mere consequence of raw power. And then, so that was the first thing that Higgins pointed out. And the second thing was that he thought, and, and I haven't, I don't know how true this is yet, he thought that some of what the ethologists who had used the term dominance hierarchy to apply to animals might have been doing was using an intrinsically Marxist framework to interpret animal behavior and to overestimate the degree to which dominance was actually the, the, the core foundation of hierarchical organizations, even among animals. And the first one's, the first objection he had, that's definitely the case. This is true. The second one, it's first, an interesting... First competence. Yeah, yeah. Case. Well, the, the idea that, that it's pure power is an unstable basis for, for, for uh, stable hierarchy, that's well documented. And I, I think that has probably moved into the realm of empirically verifiable fact. The second one, that the initial idea that it was dominance per se, that was at the basis of hierarchical arrangements, was in part a quasi-Marxist interpretation or projection. I think that's disputable. Because I think what happens is that as you go down the, um, the phylogenetic chain to simpler and simpler animals, it looks more and more like power, physical prowess, essentially is the determining factor. It certainly seems to be the case among lobsters, for example, crustaceans. They're of interest because they have, see there, there's the lobster. <laughs> Again. Um, they have relatively simple nervous systems, relatively, they're still very complex, with large neurons that are easily observable, and a, and a neurochemistry that differs from humans, but is the same, is similar in very interesting ways. And maybe an example of using skills that aren't power-based uh, or things like creativity to be able to find well, different ways to get so food or get well, mates. Well, what you want, like, you might want to figure out how you would define competence. And so uh, there's a psychometric answer to that. Psychometric, psychometricians are psychologists who are particularly interested in measurement and then also in measurement and prediction. And so one of the things you want to predict are the various human outcomes, like like economic success, let's say, or, or, or subjective well-being, which is something that Sam Harris is quite excited about, and, um, or general quality of life. These things are hard to measure, but you can measure economic success. Um, what, and what you find is that, well, there are a variety of features that predict economic success in the Western world. The, the most outstanding of those are IQ, so that's straight intelligence, and intelligence is something like processing speed and working memory capacity. So it's the ability to manipulate variables, a number of variables simultaneously at relatively high speeds. That's, and they're abstract variables. And that's, uh, that, you know, there's still people who debate about the existence of IQ, but they're called fools, fundamentally. <laughs> because, well, it, it, look, I mean, there's, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that IQ is the <clears throat> most documented phenomena in the social sciences, except for one thing. There's one, only one thing I've ever seen that, that is has been measured more powerfully and accurately, and that was the correlation between inequality across counties in the United States and male homicide rate, because that correlation is about 0.9.
And you know, like that's just, you, you never see that. The correlation between IQ and success, depending on how you measure it, academic success, learning speed, um, economic success, success as, as a manager and administrator, success as an entrepreneur or, entrepreneur or creative agent. The, the correlation between that and IQ is about 0.5, which is about three times, roughly speaking. Yeah, three times. Two to three times as powerful as the most typical next powerful order of effects that sci social scientists measure. So IQ is a walloping effect. So IQ is the first one. Hardly surprising. I mean, yeah. in, 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 especially as the environment gets more complex because IQ predicts performance in complex jobs better than it predicts performance in simple jobs. And a simple job is one where you learn it and then you repeat what you've learned, whereas a complex job is a job that changes every day. So I suspect most of you in the audience have complex jobs. And performance in... <laughs> well, <laughs> I suspect so, you know. Um, and, and, and maybe performance with complex thinking as yeah, well. Yeah, well, as long as the environment that you're, that you're operating in changes on a relatively frequent basis, then you have to have a high, high IQ to manage it effectively. That's basically what IQ measures. And then the next most... Um, relevant predictor is trait conscientiousness, which is not a trait we understand at all. We have no measures of conscientiousness that work. We've got a couple of weak ones, but no measures that really work better than self-report and other report. Could being meticulous be a good way to explain conscientiousness? It, it, meticulousness is associated with orderliness, and orderliness is one of the aspects of conscientiousness. But conscientious people, the, the best way to sum up a conscientious person is that they're very good at keeping contracts with themselves and others. So what a conscientious person will do is, first of all, say that they'll do something, so that's the first thing, mm -hmm. but then they'll actually do it. Mm -hmm. So they seem to be able to, and they seem to be that's able crucial. to- That's crucial. Well, yeah, well, it's, 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 it's crucial if, it's especially crucial if you're a manager and administrator. It's not so crucial if you're an entrepreneur. Or if you want to hold out. yourself to achieving goals. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they, they tend to be If cool. you want to work your way up the competence hierarchy, probably a good way to do that is to say, I'm going to do something and do it. Yes, well, well that's the thing. That these are, these, this, isn't, this isn't rocket science, let's say. Um, exactly. Rocket surgery, as, as, <laughs> as uh, <laughs> one of the favorite characters of a show I like in Canada tends to say that. That's the trailer park boys. Rocket surgery. <laughs> Which I think is really funny. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, look, for, so, for hey, a social, lunch bucket, get social over science here. finding, it's pretty damn self-evident, right? Smart people who work hard do better. And, but what, what that's also, what's also really cool about that, and this, it isn't viewed this way very often, is like, let's say that you were going to psychometrically validate the integrity of an economic system. So you'd say, well, you take the smart people and the, and the hardworking people and see if they do better, and if the answer is no, then this system is rotten. Right? I mean, doesn't that make sense? Because you'd expect, you'd hope, if a system is functioning, that faster, harder working people would be better at whatever it does. And it turns out that in our culture, in, in the Western culture, the correlation between conscientiousness plus IQ, you have to weight the two, and long-term life success is as high as 0.7 which is walloping, walloping correlation, given how much chance also contributes to success, right? Because you can be working hard and very smart, and then you get cancer and die, and that's the end of that. Like, there are lots of random events in life that interfere with your movement forward. And so there's an ineradicable degree of chance that, that prediction is not going to overcome. Plus, we're not that good at measuring success, so there's, there's error on the success end of the measurement as well. But IQ and conscientiousness go Those a long high. ways. Yeah. So, and that's competence. You know? And then we, the other thing we might think about with regards to defining a competence hierarchy is, imagine that one of the things you want from the operators within a hierarchy is that they maintain the hierarchy and they expand it so that it can include other people. Right? And so, competence, a good measure of competence would be the ability to work within the hierarchy while you're also expanding, maintaining it and expanding it. And so, you, that means that you would want to set up an economic system where smart, hardworking people were doing things that made other people who weren't them rich too. <clears throat> and I yeah. think we're actually pretty good at <clears throat> yeah. that. You know, if you look at the statistics, here's a good one. And th this is why people shouldn't be as pessimistic as they are, likely. It's a good feeling to make other people well off and have their well-being be, be a better. A lot, and lots of people. I mean, one of the things I've really been struck by with the people that I've known who are hyper-competent is that one of the things they really like to do is to find young people 
who need opportunities and open doors for them. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure that's not well measured, you know, but I know that, like I've seen that among the professors that I've known that I really admired, like they really like to mentor graduate schools and graduate students and develop their careers and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley that I know the same thing and good managers and administrators, they're not playing a zero sum game. Like, they're not opening the doors to everyone, I wouldn't say, but they're definitely always looking around for competent people who are young to provide opportunities to, and it's a real unsung virtue of capitalism that that sort of thing occurs. Yeah. And it's not rare. So, so, so well, so back to the, to the IQ and conscientiousness connection is like, um, like, with regards to the, say, the, the broad capitalist, the broad capitalist social and economic structure. You know, I don't know if you guys know this, but the UN said as one of its millennial goals in the year 2000 to have the rates of poverty in the world by 50% within 15 years, right? And we hit that in 2012, three years ahead of schedule. It was Boom. the fastest decrease in human poverty that has ever occurred in the history of the planet by a massive margin. And it hasn't quit. Now, obesity is a bigger problem now than starvation. It's like, we should have a party in the street for that, right? There's more fat people than there are starving people. You know, it's a perverse sort of victory, but, but it's a big one. And about 300,000 people a day right now are being plugged into the electrical grid, and the fastest growing economies are in sub-Saharan Africa. Sub Africa. It's like, there's some real reason to be thinking things are going great. And they're having you know? Amazon and Alibaba compete to provide them with those goods that they need every hmm. single day. Yeah, well, they have cell phone technology that's really made a big difference and helped stabilize the currencies and help them identify where the proper market is for their goods. And, and they're being so plugged like, into YouTube and watching mm -hmm. Jordan B. Peterson videos now. Yes, well, you know, <laughs> what, what can I say? <laughs> So, J Jordan, so, Jordan, so um, competence hierarchies. Let's look. It's better. It's better to think. Yeah. It's better to think of a well-functioning human hierarchy as one based on competence. The other thing my my colleague said to me Definitely. was that you don't want to overestimate how much power people have. Let's say in a corporate environment, because it's not obvious at all that the managers or the executives, for that matter, except in the rare cases where they're psychopathic, have fewer strictures. Have, well, sometimes you get psychopaths that rise to the top, right? I mean, otherwise there wouldn't be psychopaths. But um, it isn't obvious that people higher up in a competence hierarchy have fewer strictures on their moral behavior than people lower in the hierarchy, right? Because my sense is that responsibility increases as you move up the hierarchy, and so and your degrees of freedom with regards to moral attitude also tend to decline. Because mm. you're, you know, mm. if you're a manager of, of people, Definitely. maybe you have... 30 people working for you, and they each only have one manager. There's a lot of people that you're responsible to. And so, and you can't, mis you can't mistreat your people with any degree of consistency, because the good ones leave, the bad ones torture you to death, and the whole thing collapses across time. And so, it, the whole idea that what you have in a competence hierarchy is power, is not a reasonable assumption, as far as I can tell. That's a big deal, right? Like, we really got to get that right. Well, so it's so, a big deal. And the word competence is an empowering word. I've achieved the status that I have, whoever's speaking these words, hmm. by competence. Hmm. And then there's better mates, better food, less disease, etc., hmm. to a, climb higher. Now, since you, since you bring this up, I think this is an important point and that I really wanted to ask you about, which is that what percentage of the competence hierarchy is influenced by potentially an exertion of oppression? For, give, let me give you an mm. example. For, for example, let, let's go ahead and take our friendly lobster. Yeah. Let's take the lobster, for example. Let's say the lobster is a seafloor dwelling creature, and the lobster has... 20 shelters but the lobster only inhabits two of the shelters but it doesn't enable the other lobsters to dwell or reside in the other 18 shelters that it doesn't even use just as an example well <clears throat> <laughs> look i mean it's we could, we could think about this. One of the things that I found very interesting about looking at archetypal representations of experiential reality is that they're always 
balanced. And so the fundamental archetypal representation of the hierarchy is the wise king and the tyrant. And every hierarchy can be reasonably represented with narratives involving the wise king and the tyrant. So the wise king is the part of the hierarchy that sustains itself and expands and includes more people, right? So that's a functioning polity. And the tyrant is the fact that people operating within that hierarchy can play zero-sum games, can be willfully blind, can be malevolent, can play politics, can cease to be productive, can manipulate okay. the system for their own devices, and all of that. And it's obviously the case that every human institution, especially as they scale, falls prey to the tyrannical part of the archetype. That's why big things fall apart. Yeah. And so when you say, well, to what degree is a hierarchy to what degree does a hierarchy emerge because of tyrannical factors? The answer is, well, it depends on the hierarchy, but generally a non-trivial amount that scales with size. Okay. But that, ha having said that, that doesn't... <laughs> to say that something is partially corrupt is a lot different than saying that it's Absolutely. totally corrupt, right? There's this great story, for those of you that don't know it, in the brothers Karamazov and the atheist Ivan, who's the most compelling character, I would say, most charismatic character in the book, is torturing his younger brother, Alyosha, who's a monastic novitiate, about religion and dogma and God. And he's trying to convince Alyosha that if there is a God, he's so cruel that he's reprehensible in his fundamental element. And anyways, he tells this story about the Catholic Church, and it's called the the Grand Inquisitor, it's a very, very famous story. And in this story, Christ come back, comes back to earth to Seville in Spain at the height of the Spanish Inquisition. And he's, he reappears and he's doing miraculous things and, you know, dividing up the loaves and feeding the poor and healing the sick and being miraculous and wonderful. And the Grand Inquisitor, who runs the Spanish Inquisition, promptly has him arrested and throws him in prison. And then he, and, and, and he's, he, he decides he's going to be executed, and he comes to visit him at night, and he says, look, you know, you were here 1,500 years ago, and you're, you were perfect, and you put a moral burden on human beings that was way too great for anyone to carry, and it's taken us 1,500 bloody years to cobble together something out of your insanely positive example that normal human beings could live with, and we finally got it a little bit out, under control and dampened it down, and here you are back again, like setting up an impossible example for people. We just can't have that. We're going to do you in tomorrow. And um, Christ listens and, and is not particularly upset by all appearances about what's happening. And then the Inquisitor, who's an old man, gets up to leave. And when he leaves, Christ stands up and kisses him on the lips. And the Inquisitor turns white with shock and then leaves. And when he leaves, he leaves the door open. And that's the brilliant part of the story. Because, and that's what made Dostoevsky such an amazing genius, I would say, is even though he could write a critique of the Catholic Church, let's say, the Christian Church as powerful and as intelligent as the Grand Inquisitor, he also noticed that the dogmatic structure of the Church still left the, still left the door open for the divine individual. It's like you don't get a hierarchy yeah. without getting a tyranny along with it, you know, yeah. but, but there's a hell of a difference between the 30 or so countries in the world where anyone with any sense would want to live, and the other 150 where, that are basically run by barbaric thugs. And it's important to keep the distinction between those two things in Definitely. mind. It's like, yeah, we've got some Absolutely. things that we should put together and clean up, and you know, people are discriminated against for unfair reasons, and that's to everyone's detriment, obviously. But it's a multivariate problem, exactly. and the, 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 the positioning of someone in a hierarchy of competence is in part due to their, what would you say, to the historical context within which that hierarchy has emerged. But to say it's all a consequence of that is part of what I regard as the radical leftist war on the idea of competence itself. Because I actually think that's the fundamental narrative driving the real radical leftists, is that they hate the idea of competence itself. It's deeper than Orwell's comment, George Orwell's comment in... in uh, Road to Wigan Pier, where he said, well, the problem with middle-class British socialists is that they don't like the poor, they just hate the rich, which is like dead on, man, vicious, vicious diagnosis. It's worse than that, is that, is that the, the radical leftists don't like the oppressed, they just hate the competent. I really believe that. I think it's, I think it's unbelievably 
pathological and dangerous. It is. So the more nuanced conversations like these, rather than binary yes or no sort of reductionist conversations around complex topics like a competence hierarchy that surface to fruition in the media sphere, I think over time we will get to a point where more and more people have deeply complex and nuanced conversation about this. Um, Jordan, how about the genetic fitness landscape? Is this is it fair to say that there are a bunch of different competence hierarchies? across this plane of fitness, competent Well, there fitness. are, there are. Well, and, the, you know, there, and you know, like one of the bubbles could be who's ranked highest in the government, or one of them is who's ranked highest in space, or who's ranked highest in genetic engineering, and, or whatever field in whatever business. Well, that's why and, ideas like multiple intelligence are so attractive, even though the idea of multiple intelligence is wrong. It's clear, no, it's clearly, it's clearly wrong. Intelligence, the factor analysis have been done, and we've known this since like 1920. It's, it's not disputable. If you, if, so here's how you make an IQ test. It's really easy, and everyone should know this, because you need, you need to know how these things work. So imagine that you took a universal library of questions, any sort of question, that required abstraction to solve. It could be a general knowledge question, it could be a vocabulary question, it could be a mathematical question. It doesn't matter. It could be a question about anything, as long as it requires abstraction to solve. So you have a universal library of those questions. Then imagine you took 100 questions at random from that universal library, and you gave them to 500 people, and then you just totaled their scores, right? Right, wrong, totaled, totaled their scores. Then you rank-ordered the scores from highest performer to lowest performer. That's IQ. That's all there is to it. That's it. And then what you'd find is if you took another 100 questions from the same library, randomly selected, and gave them to the same 500 people, then you'd have two rank orders, right? From, from the top to the bottom. The correlation between the two rank orders would be about 0.9. Unbelievably high. It's unbelievably stable. Yeah. And now if you correct that for age, you get IQ. That's all there is to it. Mm. That's it. And so... Wow. Now, so, so there's no multiple intelligences, and, and that's a single factor. If you do a factor analysis, which is a statistical technique that tells you how many different attributes that, that rank ordering possesses, you get one factor. So it's one, that's that, not multiple. Now, there are multiple talents, and there are multiple temperaments, and that's where the big five model comes in. So people differ in extroversion, and extroverts are more likely to be good at sales jobs. People differ in negative emotionality, despite what the California Labor Board ruled yesterday. Um, people differ in sensitivity to negative emotion. Women are more sensitive, on average, to negative emotion than men. And the effect size of that is something like if you took a random woman and a random man out of the population, and you had to lay a bet on who had higher levels of anxiety and emotional pain, and you bet that it was the woman, you'd be right 60% of the time. So it's an interesting stat because men and women are more the same in emotional, in, in sensitivity to negative emotion than different, but there's, there's an there's a offset at the mean. And what it, that also means is that if you took the top 100 people, top one in 100 people who are the most sensitive to negative emotion, they'd almost all be women. Now, you see the, re, you see the inverse of that in some sense with regards to criminality. So... Males are more aggressive than females, and it's about the same difference. If you take a random woman and a random man out of the population, you had to bet on who was the most aggressive. If you bet it was the man, you'd be right 60% of the time, which isn't that much of the time, right? It's, it's deviation from 50-50, but it's not 90-10. It's just 60-40. But if you take the one in 100 persons who's most aggressive, yeah. and that's the person you throw in prison, by the way, they're all men. Nine out of ten of them are men. And so one of the things, and this, this goes to the complexity argument that you were talking about earlier, that it's hard for people to have a multivariate uh, discussion because we like to collapse things into single causes. But it's also hard for people to understand the statistical reality of distributions because you can have two distributions that almost entirely overlap and have walloping differences at the tails. Yep. And the tails are where all the action is. Like, who cares how aggressive you are. As long as you don't shoot or stab someone, you get to be aggressive. But if you're so aggressive that you shoot or stab someone, then you end up in prison, and you're the person that we're concerned with. And maybe that's 1% of the population. It's like, yeah, well, they're all men. And you see, this, this happens in less dramatic form, too, when you look at phenomena like uh, career selection. So there's just a data set released the other day, and this is the first time I'd seen this, showing quite clearly that as 
This is a, this is a remarkable uh, finding, and it, it builds on some earlier research, which the California Labor Board also decided was pseudoscience, which is absolutely 100% not pseudoscience. That is so wrong. No serious scientists debate the data that I'm describing. That, that nobody has debated it since like 1990. So it, it's very well settled science. Um, if you look at career choices between men and women, what you find is that they're driven in large part by temperamental differences, so that would be in the big five, extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness, and also by interest, because the biggest difference between men and women that's been measured psychometrically, forget about the physical differences, but the psychological differences, is difference in interest. And it's actually pretty big. And so men, on average, are more interested in things, and women, on average, are more interested in people. And it's a one standard deviation difference, which is a big difference by, by the standards of these sorts of differences. And it's enough to drive, the, to drive a couple of phenomena. Phenomena one. Most nurses are women. Phenomena two, most engineers are men. Why? Has nothing to do, or very little to do, if any, with differences in mathematical reasoning ability. And, I mean, that's been tracked too. So if you take junior high kids, men and women, girls and boys, and you take only those who are off the charts in terms of their mathematical interest, the, the gender difference isn't that great. There's a tiny edge for, for boys, but not much. And it's even disputable whether that edge exists. So let's assume it doesn't, for the sake of argument. If you track those kids across time, what you find is a disproportionate number of the men go into the STEM fields, and hardly any of the women. And the reason is, they're good at it, but they're not interested in it. So in the end, then you might think, well, that's sociocultural, right? We, we could change that. It's like, no, sorry, research has already been done. Um, what, there's a, so imagine you could rank order countries by how gender neutral their socioeconomic policies were. And then you put the Scandinavian countries at the top, for obvious reasons, because they've been pushing that for like three decades, four decades, and have made a lot of progress with it. Um, the biggest differences in temperament and interest in the world between men and women are in the Scandinavian countries. And the data now have revealed that there's a correlation between how gender neutral the country is and how big the differences are between the men and women, and the difference is positive, not negative. And then you think, well, is that reliable science? Or, or are the right-wing conservatives driving this scientific agenda, and the answer to that is, there are no right-wing conservatives in psychology. There are none. <laughs> I'm dead serious, man. I'm dead serious about that. So, so here's, why this, here's why this research is reliable. It's because the research is reliable because the people who generated the findings hated them. They hated the findings. They were completely biased in the other direction because everyone, everyone was hoping, everyone who's a social scientist, was hoping that as you flattened out the gender differences in the sociological landscape, you would decrease the personality differences, the individual differences, and that's not what happened. You maximized them instead. It's like, oh, oh, that, that wasn't what we expected. And, and believe me, people just didn't run to the publisher and publish these data sets. They were shocked by them. And so they replicated them, and these have been replicated across samples of tens of thousands of people and, and, and dozens of countries. It's extraordinarily reliable. It is, as far as I'm concerned, apart from the hard biological end of, this, of psychology, where there's some unbelievably solid work done, it's the most solid social science that exists, as far as I can tell, the psychometric data. And, and the reason I think that is when, when I was starting my career, um, I was looking for the most solid data, because one of the things I wanted to do was learn how to predict how people's lives transformed and changed and across time and, and what sort of me level of achievement they managed. So I was looking for the most reliable and valid measures. And it's clearly the psychometric measures are the most reliable and valid, period. No one disputes that. So except like, you know, people in women's studies and that just doesn't count. So, you know, they, they don't have a methodology. So, so the fact that there's a dispute just doesn't matter. Yeah, well, so. Here, look. <laughs> they have hypotheses, right? And that, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with generating hypotheses. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's nothing wrong with theory. But when you start to confuse theory with fact, let's say, then there's real trouble. And, you know, your theory has to be constructed at least in part so that you can make a prediction of some sort, so that you can measure what your theory says that you can measure. 
and so that you can predict something with it, and then to see whether or not your theory holds up. Otherwise, it's just a hypothesis, and that's fine, but you don't get to impose it on everyone else, because you get to state by fiat that your hypothesis is correct. It's, it's, it's reprehensible to do that, and, and, and that's being done an awful lot, an awful lot. So. I always found it interesting to think about why there weren't any groups of men that were trying to increase the amount of men that were in nursing or dental hygienists. Mm -hmm. Or um, education. Or in education, mm -hmm. social work. Mm -hmm. I always found that interesting. I always, and then I... They're really, lower paid, uh, the disciplines. Um, it, and, then, and then I recently started thinking about this in terms of sports with the uh, NFL and NBA. And I was like, hmm, there are just less Asian people and Latino people and white people, there's just, there's more black people mm -hmm. that are just better athletes. And are we going to decrease the standards for people of different, from a, that are Asian or Latino to, to, to well, get more of them one into of the professional thing, well, sports? Well, one of the things is funny that, that the, the discussion about um, gender differences in occupational position, let's say, is unbelievably narrow. You know, it tends to focus on the highest corporate positions. It, that's not all of it, but it tends to focus on the highest corporate positions or the highest paid positions. But certainly, it's quite interesting, if, if, you're, if you're into this sort of thing, I suppose, to go online and just look up the labor statistics from, from the American federal government, because they, they, they rank order occupations by gender, you know, proportion. And bricklayers, are, are, that's, the, yeah. that's the occupation that's the most gender skewed. There's like no female bricklayers. And, but no one cares about that. And it's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, no, but it is interesting because it's not like bricklayers don't make a good living. You know, like skilled tradespeople make a damn good living. But heavy machinery operators, very few women there too. So, but the percentage the, of work-related deaths, 93%. Well, that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, that, there's a bunch That's of reasons high. why men make more money on average than women do. And one of them is that they're, they're more willing to work outside. That's one. They're more willing to move. That's another. They're, they work longer hours. And if you work 13% more hours, you make 40% more money on. That, that's the stat. So, so the, the effect of overtime is nonlinear. 13% more hours, 40% more income? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can, you, I think that's a good example of how, you know, let's say you have a bunch of employees and you're trying to differentiate them for promotion. Like, and let's say they're all operating within a relatively narrow band. Perhaps they aren't, but let's say for this example they are. It's like, well, the, the person who puts out 10% more, self-evidently, so, well, this guy's around like 10% more. That, that would be what, about an extra 45 minutes a day, something like that. He goes the extra mile. Well, he's going to get the promotion. And so you also get this... Like, it also looks, and this is worth thinking about too, and this is part of the Pareto distribution problem, is that success is disproportionately rewarded. It's not linear. So as, as you start to succeed, the prob each success non-linearly increases the probability of the next success. Right? So The doors so, open. Yeah, 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 that's right. And, and not one door, but they open exponentially. Right, exactly. And so, and as you fail, they close exponentially. So you might think, well... Su failure, success, linear. It's like, no, failure, success, right? So once you start to fail, good luck to you, right? Because each failure increases the probability of the next failure in a nonlinear fashion. And that really, if you're on a downhill trend, man, that's really vicious, and it's hard to get out of it. You see that happen to big companies when they start to go into a death spiral. They can't pull themselves out of it. But by the same token, when you start to succeed, each success increases the probability of the next one. You actually even see that with lobsters. So back to the crustaceans. <laughs> well, it's so interesting that some of these things are so fundamental that they appear so low in the phylogenetic chain. So if you, if you tally up, a, you watch a lobster engage in sequen sequential dominance disputes, so basically physical challenges. Um, his probability... If he, loses the prob if he loses a battle, the probability that he'll lose the next battle is higher than you would expect if you just derived a linear function that was a consequence of the tally of his previous victories and losses. So because he's lost, he's more likely to lose 
harder the next time. But if he wins, he's statistically more likely to win. So, and, and that also drives, well, that's a fundamental issue too. That drives the disproportionate distribution of productive goods and material resources, which is a very big problem. And it's another we'll thing we need there. to have an intelligent discussion about in our De society. Definitely, we're going to get there in this conversation as well. So just before we wrap up the point about Big Five and gender, I have a, a thought about this, and it involves a company that is very close to us here in the Bay Area, Google. And the question about Google is, could it potentially be in the interest of a company to want to bring diverse people from around the world in to increase the creativity of their output. Depends on how you define diverse, but I would say you guys have already done that in Silicon Valley. It's like, well, how many people, how many people in Silicon Valley are from the Indian Institute of Technology? It's like, God, they're everywhere. You know, and, and no wonder, well, so that's a, but that's cognitive, that's, that's cognitive ability. Like, look, well, somebody a huge that's, part of it is. Someone that's birthed in a different part of the world yeah. that has a different upbringing that could potentially bring something unique, a unique perspective. Yeah, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. <laughs> there's no, there's, they, no, there's no evidence for that. That is not how you get, that's not the right definition of diversity. But and could I, it also be potentially that we are not measuring and focusing on that in order to find that data? No. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, because look, Measuring success is not an easy thing. It's you think it should be meritocracy no matter what, period? No, there's, a, there's, a, okay. there's always a fly in the ointment. A fly, the fly in the ointment. Well, okay. the, 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 there is. There's, so the other thing, there's a good book that I would recommend reading called uh, The Great Leveler by Walter Scheidel. It's a new book, relatively new book. And he details out the, he details out the ineradicability of inequality. So part of the problem with this process that we just described where success breeds success and failure breeds failure is that the people who are succeeding get a disproportionate share of the resource pie, let's say. Um, so, and you know, everyone knows that about money, right? Because the 12 richest people in the world, the 85 richest people in the world have as much money as the bottom 2 billion, which seems, well, let's say unfair. Now, it's certainly unequal. Now, whether it's I, I believe, is Jordan, the statistic is the eight, eight richest have equal to the bottom 3.5 billion. Yeah, well, it's probably worse than it was when I looked at this about three years ago. So, but it, do, it doesn't matter because you, you, you get the point. But, but it's, um, it's but crazy. The thing is, is that this is not something that only applies to money. It applies to everything that's creatively produced. So the same rule applies to number of records sold by recording artists. The same rule applies to number of books sold by novelists. The same rule applies to number of goals scored by NHL hockey players. The same rule applies to the population of cities and the mass of stars and the size of trees in the, in the jungle. It's like the inequality problem is way more troublesome, again, than mere capitalism. It's a terrible problem. And Scheidel's work, which is really, really interesting, he's traced back inequality 10, 15,000 years using, you can do it for example, let's say you find a Neolithic burial site and there's 200 people in it. So these people would be buried with their possessions and obviously some of them decay, but some of them don't. And like some of them are buried with gold. Well, hardly any of them. And the tiny proportion of people who are bu buried with gold are buried with a lot of gold. So you can even derive a Gini coefficient estimate, which is an estimate of inequality from burial sites. And it looks like as soon as you get a surplus, you get inequality. And that's a rough thing, eh? Because you might think, well, even in hunter-gatherer societies where there's no surplus, there's still inequality, because there's inequality of friendship, there's inequality of health, and there's inequality of sexual access. And those things are, they are not trivial. But when you're thinking about it purely economically, you start to get inequality as soon as you get a surplus. You think, oh, that's interesting. So there's a natural rule, which is, Surplus generates inequality. All right, so how do you solve that? And Scheidel's book says, well, that's easy. You just get rid of the surplus. Right, and that's not good. So like he, he found, and so one of the things he did was statistical analysis, because one of the things he might ask is, well, let's say you have your measures of inequality, and then you can track them around the world, and you can track whether or not the inequality is generated by a right-wing government or a left-wing government. And then you might hope, well, the left-wing governments would ameliorate inequality. There's no evidence for that at all. 
It doesn't look like inequality is with... It, it doesn't look like the amelioration of inequality is within the purview of political organization. Yeah. And, and you, should, yeah. like, you should not hear that with any degree of happiness whatsoever, because the social science on inequality is also clear. As inequality levels increase, societies destabilize. And the best indicator yeah. of that, I already mentioned that, that was work that was done by um, uh, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson at McMaster University in, in Canada. They were really interested in what drove male homicide, because most homicide is male, male on male. It's mostly young males. It's mostly within race. And it's mostly status competition, right? So, and the status competitions get intense where inequality increases. So where everyone's poor, so if you rank order American states and Canadian provinces by inequality, the poorer provinces where everyone's poor, there's no male aggression, and the rich provinces and states where everyone's rich, there's no male, male homicide. But the states and provinces where inequality is high, the male homicide rate starts to climb up. And it's probably the most aggressive males who get most aggressive most rapidly when inequality increases. So there's a psychological component, but inequality drives male homicide. 0.9 is the correlation, which means that you actually don't need any other explanation for male homicide. Maybe you throw in alcohol just, just as, a, as an extraneous variable. You don't need any other explanation for the male homicide rate than inequality. It's staggering work. It's absolutely staggering work. And so the... The thing is, is that a meritocracy will drive inequality. And then you have a problem because people stack up at zero, and they can't get out of zero. Because that's what happens as inequality increases, people. Think about when you're playing Monopoly, you know, the game. I mean, that's a perfect example of how inequality emerges. Everybody's equal to begin with. Everybody basically plays a random game, because Monopoly's basically a random game. I mean, there's some skill in it, but not much. So, so it's a random game. So what happens when everyone starts equal and you play a random game? One person ends up with everything. Everyone else stacks up at zero. Now, Scheidel's book basically shows the only way out of that is various forms of war, including revolution, and epidemics. That's it. That's the only thing he's been able to track. That, and, and what happens is, well, you level everyone, and then inequality decreases. It's like, well, mm. okay. Mm. Like... <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem like a really great solution. So Jordan, this seems to be even more and more pressing with the proliferation of artificial intelligence, robotics, genetic engineering, neural prosthetics, nanotechnology, and the race between China and the United States and Russia colonizing Mars. What is going, how do we actually end up coming to a global consensus on what to do as eight people equate in wealth to the bottom well, I don't See, this billion. is why we have to have an intelligent discussion about this, because on the one hand, it's pretty obvious that modern economies are doing a damn good job of lifting people rapidly out of abject poverty. Okay. But at the same time, the inequality of, of economic, the economic inequality, by some measures at least, is increasing. And that does have this destabilizing effect. And so then the question is, what, what do you do about it? Well, it's really hard because in a meritocracy, part of that's driven by um, segregation by intelligence. And then that's likely exaggerated by the provision of computational power because a really smart person with a computer is way smarter than a really smart person without a computer and is, and is way smarter than a person who isn't so smart either with or without a computer. Right, so the computational technology looks like it's a multiplier, like I'm sure many of you already know. You know, because there's a huge difference between someone who can really use a computer and someone who's barely computer literate. And lots of, way more people are barely computer liter literate than you know. So here's a good stat. This is, like I'm really familiar, I've really familiarized myself with the IQ literature, and it's a dismal, horrible literature. But, but you really need to know it, because it's a solid literature, unfortunately. And... Um, one of the most terrifying statistics I ever came across was uh, one detailing out the rationale of the United States Armed Forces for not allowing the induct... You can't induct anyone into the Armed Forces in the U.S. if they have an IQ of less than 83. Okay, so let's just take that apart for a minute, because it's a horrifying thing. So the U.S. Armed Forces has been in the forefront of intelligence research since World War I, because they we're on board early with the idea that, especially during wartime, when you're ramping up quickly, that you need to sort people effectively and 
essentially without prejudice so that you can build up the officer corps so you don't lose the damn war. Okay, so there's real motivation to get it right, right? Because it's a life and death issue. So they used IQ. They did a lot of the early psychometric work on IQ. Okay, so that's the first thing. They're, they're motivated to find an accurate predictor, so they settled on IQ. The second thing was the United States Armed Forces is also really motivated to get people into the armed forces, peacetime or wartime. Wartime, well, for obvious reasons, peacetime because, well, first of all, you've got to keep the armed forces going, and second, you can use the armed forces during peacetime as a way of taking people out of the underclass and moving them up into the working class or the middle class, right? You can use it as a training mechanism. And, and so there's, and left and right can agree on that, you know, it's, it's a reasonable way of promoting social mobility. So again, the armed forces, even in peacetime, is very motivated to get as many people in as they possibly can. And it's difficult as well. You, it's not that easy to recruit people, so you don't want to throw people out if you don't have to. So what's the upshot of all that? Well, after a hundred years, essentially, of, of statistic, careful statistical analysis, the armed forces concluded that if you had an IQ of 83 or less, there wasn't anything you could possibly be trained to do in the military at any level of the organization that wasn't positively counterproductive. Okay, you think, well, so what? 83, okay. Yeah, 1 in 10. 1 in 10. That's 1 in 10 people. And that, what that really means, that as far as I can tell, is if you imagine that the military is approximately as complex as the broader society, yes. which I think is a reasonable yes. proposition, <clears throat> then there's no place in our cognitively complex society for one in ten people. So what are we going to do about that? The answer is, no one knows. You say, well, shovel money down the hierarchy. It's like, the problem isn't lack of money. I mean, sometimes that's the problem. But the problem is rarely absolute poverty. It's rarely that. It is sometimes, but rarely. It's not that easy to move money down the hierarchy. So, first of all, it's not that easy to manage money. So, it's a vicious problem, man. And so... It's hard to train people to become creative, adaptive, problem solvers. It's impossible. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can well, it interfere with their cognitive years, ability. But, but you, can't, you can't do that. It's training doesn't work. It's really not going to work well in six think. months, but it could work in six years. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't work. Like, the data on that's crystal clear as well. Look, I can give you an example. So, I know a bunch of people who run MBA programs, and I've had discussions with them because the thing about an MBA program is it's just, if it's selective, it's really hard to get in. It's like getting into Harvard. It's really hard to get into Harvard. You have to have an IQ that places you at least at the 99th percentile, and then you have to be really good at at least one or two other things. So, it's really hard to get in. Okay, so you think, well, why hire a Harvard graduate? Well, it's the quality of the education. It's like, no, it's not. It's the fact that it's really hard to get in. All of the value of the Ivy League education is in the screening before the, before the, uh, before the education starts. Now, that doesn't mean that people, people go to Harvard and they get educated, but they'd get just as educated if they went somewhere else. First of all, it's like every university contains more information than any student can ever possibly process. If you're super smart, uh, you, you can be dropped into a state college somewhere, a low-level state college. You spend four years in the library. You know, like, what are you going to do, read the whole library? No. <laughs> right. So, so, and the data on this is quite clear. It's like, and it's the same with private schools. The reason that pri people who go to private schools do better than people who go to public schools is because, generally speaking, the people who go into private schools are smarter. It's not the education that's any better. And so we radically overestimate the degree to which training works. So now you can train people to be stupid, that's, but training them to be smarter than they are is really, really, really hard. So, it, like I said, it's a dismal literature. And liberals, see, the liberals think everyone's roughly equal, and there's a job for everyone, you just have to train them. It's like, no, wrong. And the conservatives think, well, there's a job for everyone if they just get off their ass and, look, and work. It's like, no, no, that's wrong too. Even though, if you work, that's better, and, well, so that, that's on the conservative end, but the liberals won't take into account individual differences. Well, obviously, that's part of what the whole politically correct discussion is about. It's like, everyone's the same. It's like, yeah, um, they're not. <laughs> you know, and I find it, it's really, it's really annoying, I would say, like, I love, love to come to Silicon Valley. I've been here many, many times, and, like, it's really something to come here and, and, and meet 
there's so many people here who are off the scales intelligent, and they're all, you know, clustered together, which is why this place is so unbelievably rich and so unbelievably productive, one of the reasons. But it's, very, it's also very annoying that it's so left-leaning, because one of the things that the left-leaning Silicon Valley geniuses should understand that is that they're the beneficiary of a genetic lottery. Mm -hmm. And they should take that seriously. It's like, yeah, yeah, you worked hard. Yes, you're entrepreneurial. Yes, you're on point. You put in your 60 hours a week. You know, you do everything you could. But you have an IQ of 150. And, like, that's not your doing. Mm -hmm. Right? That's something that happened to you. And so, you can't be saying, well, it's, it's all me. It's like, no, yeah. it's not. It's all you and the genius that you were granted as, a, as an infant. It's, that's it. That's what's driving it. Now, that, that doesn't mean, I think, that people of disproportionate intelligence shouldn't be rewarded disproportionately. It's possible that they should, because it might be in the best interest of everyone else to dump as much money as possible to the top 2% of the cognitive strata, because they're going to be most generative with it. And so, and even if it's not fair, because you might say, well, just because you won the genetic lottery, does that mean that you should have more money than anyone else? It's like, well, not on the grounds of fairness, but if you have to distribute money, well, who are you going to distribute it to? You know, and I think, to was it Ted, who ran CNN? Ted Turner. Mm -hmm. He estimated that if you tried as hard as you could in your entire life, there was no way that you could spend more than $400 million. And so let's say you have more money than that at your disposal. Well, hopefully you're going to do some halfway intelligent things with it, and hopefully you'd expect that the more intelligent people would do more than halfway intelligent things with it. So if you have to have unequal distribution, then a meritocracy is probably the best way to do it. But it still leaves you with this terrible problem, which is, what do you do with all the people who stack up at zero? And the answer isn't have contempt for them because they don't work as hard as you. It's like, yeah, a bunch of them don't, you know, because conscientiousness also predicts success. So among the poor, there are people who don't work, you know, but you never want to underestimate the contribution of cognitive ability. So it's rough, man, and, and we don't take it seriously, and we don't know what to do about it. And yeah. it's clear that as inequality increases, societies yeah. destabilize. That's clear. So it's something that has to be dealt with, and, but we don't know how to deal with it. We don't know how to efficiently move resources to the bottom end of the competence hierarchy so that things don't destabilize. So, you know, and I've worked with people, lots of people, who are, who are at the bottom end of the hierarchy in my clinical practice. And you know, like cocaine addicts, for example, low, I, low IQ cocaine addicts. Not, not all cocaine addicts have low IQ, by the way, but, you know, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a triple whammy, let's say, because if you're a cocaine addict, you're probably also an alcoholic. And so if you're a cocaine addict and you're an alcoholic and you're sort of on the low end of the cognitive distribution, it's like you have a pretty damn rough life. There's a lot of things going wrong for you. And you're really lucky if you're flat broke because as soon as you get money, you are so done, you cannot believe it. So like, when your unemployment check comes in and you're a cocaine addict alcoholic who isn't employed, the probability that three days later you're going to end up face down in a ditch is really, really high. So don't be thinking, like, it's not so simple that you can just dump money down the competence hierarchy to the, to the people who are in the underclass and expect that that's going to have a salutary effect. I don't think there's any evidence for that whatsoever. Like, money is not an easy resource to use productively. So... Is a class-based speciation something to be concerned about? Um, elaborate on that a little bit. What do you mean exactly? Well, by class-based speciation, meaning there's already a tremendous amount of wealth that is accumulated within such a small percentage of people. And whether it be through a bifurcation, a split of a couple billion people off of the human species, or it could be a trifurcation, we don't know how many splits there may be, whether that... Well, I don't know if it's something to worry about or something to hope for. I mean, this time scales are so large that it, it's probably not relevant to individuals. Potentially something to hope for in the evolutionary trajectory of the human well, species. Well, you kind of hope that people get smarter, might, might get smarter across time. I, I, I guess we would hope that might be a good thing. I mean, it's not self-evident. So, so if it is a lottery, <clears throat> if it was a roll of the dice to be born where we are, don't we also feel that it could have been a roll of the dice to be born in a place less fortunate, therefore... Sure, we do feel that. I think that's why that, and if, you know, even if successful people often feel guilty because of inequality. 
It's I mean, no your, wonder. your ultimate calling in terms of the, with the religion and with, uh, with finding self-actualization and meaning within you is to, like you say, eradicate suffering is something that is, gives so much meaning to life. Well, the, sometimes people in less fortunate circumstances experience lots of suffering with lack of food or water or shelter or basic physiological yeah. needs. And so then, therefore, doesn't it feel like within this potential class-based speciation with wealth that there should be some sort of assistance? Of course. Of course it does. Okay, and now the well, conversation that's also the is basis. how do we do that? Well, so there's a couple of things there. I mean, to the degree, like, you know, I've been a vocal opponent of the radical left, and I, I, I can't detest them enough, really, is, is, a fundamental, is the fun, my fundamental position. But... <clears throat> But um, that doesn't mean that I, I don't think that uh, a functioning polity requires a left and a right wing. Absolutely. And the reason it requires a left wing is because inequality is real. And it, it has to be addressed. It has to be addressed for all the reasons that you described. But, but that, <laughs> having said that, there are ways to go about addressing it that are clearly counterproductive. And those were tried to great destructive power in the 20th century, and I don't really think we need to do that again. The a corollary to that is we don't know what the productive means are. Now, I've been thinking a lot about that, you know, and I'm thinking, well, how do you solve the problem of inequality? And it has to be something like the moral burden on those who are successful has to be increased. It's something like that. And I, I think you see that. I mean, well, I think I wrote this to you that what's the significance of purchasing a third yacht rather than maybe hiring 50 people to solve a problem in well, the it's, world? Well, it's hard. These things aren't so simple. You know, like, let's say that you decide to go out to a restaurant and your meal is $500. And you might think, well, that's reprehensible. And well, or perhaps you don't think that's reprehensible. But the thing is, it's not a bad way of dispersing extra money. So it's not that obvious what rich people should do with their money that's beneficial. And you think, well, should you buy a third yacht because do you really need it? And, well, that's a particularly, per perhaps a particularly egregious example. But it's not like you're not employing people when you do that. You shouldn't stuff the money in your mattress. We could say that, right? Because that's just pure hoarding. But most people who have money aren't like Scrooge McDuck. They don't have a money bin that they swim in, right? Their money... Well, that's, that's, the, kind of, that's the kind of clueless picture of wealth. I mean, most people who have money, their money is out there doing things. It's not like they're... It's not like it's in their bedroom, you know, it's in, in, in gold coin form. So they're not hoarding it in exactly the same way that perhaps people used to hoard wealth when it wasn't as what, abstracted and, and, and functional in its own terms out there in the economy. Their money is usually working for them, making them more money. Yeah, but it's also doing a bunch of other things, you know. And if you're a bad money manager, even if you're wealthy, your money tends to disappear very rapidly. That's another thing that's really worth knowing, is that, like, there is a 1%, and that 1% does have a disproportionate amount of the money, and 1% of that 1% has an even more disproportionate amount of the money. It scales all the way up the, up, up the measurement spectrum, let's say. But there's actually quite a bit of mobility within that 1%. So you have a 10% chance in your lifetime in the United States of being in the top 1% for at least a year. Now, that's not like a 100% chance, but it's mm -hmm. 1 in 10. Mm -hmm. It's not dismal, mm -hmm. you know. So well, partly what you hope for is that there's some genuine upward mobility. But then I think the other thing that you hope for is that people who are disproportionately successful take it upon themselves to do everything they possibly can to do whatever they can that's the best possible thing to do with their money. And, you know, I'm kind of an admirer of Bill Gates for a variety of reasons, but he's doing a really good job of, of putting the boots to the, five wor the world's five worst transmissible diseases, you know, and that's yeah. going quite nicely, you know. They're making some real polios just about defunct. Yep. Um, they're making some real progress with malaria. Like, there's almost nothing that could mm -hmm. be possibly be done for Africa that would be more useful than to get rid of malaria. Sleeping sickness would be another one that would be really useful to, er to eradicate. And so I would say that the long-term solution, assuming that there is one, to the problem of inequality is that people who are disproportionately fortunate, let's say, or successful, or both, take, it upon, take the moral duty of doing the best possible 
good that they can with the money that they generate. Correct. But the other thing I think that's sort of interesting about that is I actually don't think there's anything more interesting to do with your money than Correct. that. Correct. It's yeah. like, can you think of anything more interesting to do with your money than to find a really difficult problem that causes a bunch of people suffering and then try to fix it? It's like, it's amazing. if you have a clue, that's got to be a little better than a third yacht. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's pretty low. Well, it's kind of a low, br like that conspicuous consumption thing. At, at some point, it's just... If you have any sense, at some yeah, point, that's yeah, just not yeah. very impressive. Could, could another way to address the potential class-based speciation be the education of the child? And by the principles of, let's say that, over the last hundred billion people that have lived and died to build this beautiful world we live in today with all of the food and water ubiquity and the governments and the economies, that... There, every child that's being stamped out into this world might have a little tiny missing chip on their shoulder. And that missing chip might be things like their parents explaining to them what evolution is or what their anatomy, what their heart and their brain is, their body, maybe what morality is, things like that. If maybe every child is born with a little bit of something like that. Do you think there's something like that, Jordan? Yeah, oh. this. You know, like that's done, right? This thing is connecting everyone to everything. And so the probability that people are going to be, get whatever education they want in the next 30 years is overwhelmingly high. So I think in some sense, that problem is being solved as rapidly as it can possibly be, be being solved. That is, doesn't mean people should stop trying to find more and more effective ways of educating. I think that would be really Are good. Are there but some general basic principles that you think a parent should teach a child, obviously within the rules of life, but it may be something about evolution or something about their own anatomy? And well, I think that... I. I think that there are all sorts of things that parents who are good parents teach their children. I mean, part of what 12 Rules for Life is about is about that. It's like a universal ethic in some sense. There, I think that there is a, there's dawning realization among members of the biologically oriented community, let's say, that there is something like an emergent ethic that's evident in biological systems. And, um, one of the most outstanding examples of that, I would say, is apart from the work that DeWall has done with chimpanzees showing the beginnings of an ethic, at least in, in the behavioral sense, the beginnings of an ethic among chimpanzees is work that's been done with rats. And so Jacques Panksepp, for example, who wrote a book called Affective Neuroscience, which I would highly recommend. It's a real work of genius. You blew he, my mind with Piaget, by the way, mm. with the way that rats... No, that's Panksepp. That's, that that's wasn't Panksepp. Piaget? No, Piaget found that, out, found that out in children. So oh. Panksepp was the scientist who discovered that rats laugh. That's right. And you think, well, that's not a big deal. It's like, actually, it is a really big deal because it shows, that it shows commonality of the positive emotion systems across biological strata, essentially. So it's actually a really big deal. And he found that if you tickle rats with an eraser, they laugh ultrasonically. Yeah, yeah. And so you have to slow it down to hear them. And the reason he figured that out was because he was trying to figure out why if you take rat pups away from their mother and feed them and give them enough water, they still die. So they die unless you massage them with... Well, he used a pencil eraser, that's what... Because it's kind of soft, it seems to work without har harming the rats, little rat pups. And if you rub them with pencil eraser, then they'll thrive. And that was actually translated very rapidly into practical research because it turns out that if you have a premature infant, it's in our incubator. They often lose weight, eh? which is a really bad thing because they're mm -hmm. supposed to be gaining weight. Mm -hmm. But if you massage them three times a day for 10 minutes, then they'll gain weight about as fast as they do in utero. And they leave the hospital on average five days earlier. And the beneficial cognitive and physiological effects are still detectable six months down the road. It's a walloping, it's a walloping effect. And so it turns out that one of the things Panksepp sorted out was that human, the touch is a human need. It's not a secondary need, it's a mm -hmm. primary need like, like food and water. And childhood and, development. Yeah, yeah, well, and, and he, he was also a big proponent of rough and tumble play because yeah. he found out that in rats that rough and tumble play, especially among juvenile males, catalyzes prefrontal development and that rat pups who are male that aren't allowed to engage in rough and tumble play show prefrontal hypo development and you can then treat them with Ritalin.
which is the ADHD drug, just in case you're wondering. So that's a very dismal line of scientific research, but also very promising. So what Panksepp also found, and this is another piece of information that really blew me away when I first, first read about it, was so he, 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 Panksepp discovered the play circuitry in mammals. And that's also a big deal, right? That's like discovering a continent, and to discover a dedicated circuitry to a set of complex biological functions. That's a big deal, man. And so um, when he was ex investigating play behavior among rats, he noticed that juvenile males in particular would work to wrestle. And they wrestle really a lot like, well, human children or like human children and dogs wrestle and rats pin each other. So. Um, what Panksepp found first was that, and other scientists as well, but I'll use him as a shorthand, was that rats would work to enter a play arena where they knew they were going to be allowed to wrestle with a, a peer. And that's kind of how you figure out if a rat wants to do something, right? You make them button press for it or pull on something, and then you can measure how fast he'll press the button or how hard he'll pull, and you can get some estimate of how motivated he is. And rats are pretty damn motivated to enter into a play arena. And so if one rat enters into a play arena, and another rat does, and the one rat is 10% bigger than the other, then in like nine out of 10 cases, the big rat can pin the little rat. And in the first bout, then pinning establishes dominance. This is kind of an interesting commentary on scientific methodology too, because let's say that you were investigating rat behavior and you were trying to draw conclusions and you only paired rats together once, you'd assume the big rat dominates, it's physical size that does the domination, and that's the purpose of play. But that isn't right, because it's play... got to let it win every play, once in a well, while. Well, play is something that iterates, right? You don't play with a person only once. You play with them, well, who knows for how long, right? If it's a relationship that lasts decades, then it's decades of reciprocal interaction. So Panksepp and his colleagues and the other scientists who are working on this paired the rats repeatedly. So these are iterated games. And the rules of an iterated game aren't the same as the rules of a one-off game. And that might actually be the basis for mm -hmm. a universal ethic, is that there are rules for iterated games. And what Panksepp found was that, okay, so the big rat is now superordinate to the little rat. Now when you repair them, the little rat has to ask the big rat to play. That's the rule. So the big rat gets to sit there like he's cool, and the little rat has to hop up like, like a dog that's asking you to play and sort of bounce around. You all know what that looks like. Dog kind of puts its rear end up in the air, kind of hops a little bit, and that means like, well, come on, human, mm -hmm. cuff me, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you have any sense, you know how to do that. And, and you can even understand when a dog does it. And the dog, if he's socialized, can understand when you're doing it, right? Because a well-socialized dog is, you kind of you go like this, and then he does the same thing, and you whack him on the side of the head a little bit, and he growls and puts his, you know, your hand in his mouth, but he doesn't bite it, but he sounds like he's going to. The dog knows what the hell's going on, unless it's completely, unless it's raised by a behavioral psychologist, which is... <laughs> Anyways, the worst behaved dog I ever saw was a dog that was raised by a behavioral psychologist. So, so anyway, sorry about that, but... So anyway, so you pair these rats together, and what you find is that, so the little rat has to ask the big rat to play, and the big rat will, like, you know, break is cool and then wrestle. And then if you pair them repeatedly, unless the big rat lets the little rat win 30% of the time, the little rat will no longer ask him to play. Yeah. Like, and I read that, it was like, a little Ooh. electrical storm went off in my that brain. That is what thought, happened to me too. Well, it's so good, so, un so absolutely unbelievable, is that, well, there you have it, it's emergent ethic of reciprocity. Yeah. All you need to yeah. do is pair animals together in reciprocal play bouts, and you have an emergent reciprocity. And then you think, well, okay, so that's the basis for social interaction, is that re reciprocity. There's a bit of an advantage to the, to the big rat, but not a huge advantage. Say, well, that's the beginning of an ethic. And you say, well, human beings, that ethic emerged at the biological level, and then human beings watched it develop and told stories about it, that's where the stories came from. And then out of the stories, we coded an explicit ethic. And that's where the philosophy of ethics came from. But it emerged from the bottom up. Something Nietzsche predicted like Love 150 it. years ago. He said, well, you know, we'll Love find it. that there was an emergent ethic that emerged biologically and then was later mapped. And so that was just, well, that's just absolutely beyond belief. Yes. And then very likely true and points the way to something like well, an archetypal ethic, certainly, one of reciprocity, which is, which is I think, the fundamental ar archetypal ethic. It's like, well, here's another example. Jo Jordan, maybe just 
because yep. we we want to touch on a bunch of other okay. points as well. We we're we're amazingly in depth in this. This is so cool. Well, um, universal um, ethic is important, as it turns out. It, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell just a brief story. Okay. All right, because this is also this is also extremely important because it shows where the classical economists are brief wrong. Brief so story. Brief, brief. Jordan Peterson. Yeah, I know. I know. It's not likely. So let's play a trading game. Okay, so you two can play this trading game. So here's the deal. It's very simple. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars. I'm, I'm not actually, but <laughs> I'm going to give you a hundred dollars, and you can offer some of it to your partner in the game. But the rule is, if she says no, you don't get anything, and neither does she. And you only get to make one offer. So, okay, here's your $100. How much are you going to offer her? 40 Okay, would you take 40 Okay, that, now that's interesting. Wow. Okay, very good. That's perfect. Okay, so first of all, the classic econo economist would say, you should offer her a dollar. Why? Well, because she might as well take a dollar because she gets a dollar. Yeah, and yeah. you want to maximize your own return. So you get $99. It's like... What happens when you do that? What happens is that is never what people do. They usually offer approximately 50%. Yeah. What's, and, and if they don't, then the other person refuses. Yeah. Now, then you might think, well, let's say you matched a rich person and a poor person, and you said, okay, give the rich person 100, and they offer the poor person a dollar. What does the poor person say? You think, well, yeah, yeah, I need the dollar. So they, they say, no, go to hell. I'm not doing it. Because, and they're more likely, the poor person is more likely to refuse the lower offer than a rich person is. Completely running completely contrary to the predictions of classical economists. Huh. You play that game across the world, it's pretty much 50 50. And I, that's so interesting because it's another example of that emergent ethic. It's like, well, part of the reason you'd say no and why no is correct is because you don't play one trading game, you play a lifetime of trading games. And the right answer to the question of how to play a lifetime of trading games is to not settle for less than 50%. But you could also make a case that if you're the giver rather than receiver, if you're playing an iterated game, you might want to offer $60. Because especially if your reputation is being broadcast, because let's say your goal isn't to get $40, which is what you'd be left if you offered $60. Your goal is to let everybody know that if they play with you, you give them $60 and you get $40. And then what happens is like, well, let's take a vote on who wants to play with who. It's like, you want to play with the person who offers you 10? Or do you want to play with the person who offers you 60? And then the person who's a little more generous than reciprocal, you know, 50-50 would be reciprocal, maybe you should err on the side of generosity. Why? Well, easily, easy. People will line up to play with you. So then the question is, do you mm -hmm. want to win the game? Or do you want to win the set of games? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think... I think there's rules that govern the set of all possible games. And it's the rules that govern the set of all possible games that constitute something like an emergent ethic. So, anyway, so that's a very useful thing to know. It's a very useful thing to know. It is. So, well, can you give a couple quick ones of those potential universal ethics that govern the set of games? Well, I think, I think that's the big one. I think, I think the big one is you, you approximate reciprocity, but it would be better, it'd be better if you can figure out how to... I think you, it's recipro reciprocity with erring on the side of generosity. Because there's just no downside to that in an iterated game. It's like, I'm going to borrow... What I do when I grade papers with students, for example, is I grade them and then I add 5%. It's like, well, maybe I made a mistake, so I'll err on the side of generosity. Right? And why not do that in your reciprocal interactions? That doesn't mean you're letting people take advantage of you. Right? It's not a matter of weakness in your negotiating strategy, because there's no excuse for that. That's, just, that's a losing game, that. But if you could take 50% or 70% and you decide to be generous, it's like, well, you still have to be awake so that you're not being messed about with by people who are a little bit on the psychopathic end. You know, you don't want to be foolish about it. But reciprocal plus generous, that's a hell of a good start. So can we do a quick dive into science and God? Because I want, I want to... Not quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's try. So, let's try. Can science sufficiently, consistently self-actualize humans? Well, 
Okay, let because with with your with God with religion, people find some sort of self actualization. Can science be a source of self actualization or mora- not, morality? Not, not the way that we normally construe science. Like, if you look at let let's make that concrete for for a minute. Um, when when I teach my students my personality class, and we concentrate a fair bit on clinical theories because I'm a clinician. One of the things I make clear to them is that neither medicine nor clinical psychology are sciences. They're, they're, they're variants of engineering. They're attempting to build something. There's an end in mind. There's an ethical end in mind, right? I mean, what you do when you're a clinical psychologist is try to help people make their lives better. Now, you might say, well, you're trying to make them more mentally healthy. But actually, that's a weaker description than that you're trying to make their lives better. Because sometimes, as a clinical psychologist, you see people who are, you know, they're normal in their health, but they would like their lives to be better. There's an up, obviously. But, and that introduces the ethical realm. And you might be able to use scientific techniques in order to determine which of the strategies you use to try to make your life better are working. But it's not obvious that you can use scientific principles to decide what constitutes better to begin with. You That's a big so. problem. You, I don't see any evidence that you can. Well, how about... Because science, let, let, science let, excludes ex- morality from its purview at the methodological level. Well, okay, let's take an example of cancer and science solving suffering by providing solutions to cancer. Yeah, well, should you devote money to cancer education? That's, see, that's where the problems start to come, is that you, you, can't, you can't make an a priori decision, you can't make an informed decision about where the ethical, where the, uh, the scientific attention should focus itself. It's not an easy thing to do. At some point, the decisions have to be, they're either arbitrary or they're made by, they're made by techniques that seem to be outside of the scientific purview. Let me give you an example. So, I read this book by an ex-KGB agent who had detailed out some of the extent of the Soviet uh, biological warfare program back in the 1980s. And one of the things the Soviet scientists were trying to do, according to this guy, was to uh, weaponize um, biological infectious biological agents, which actually turns out to be harder than we suspected, thank God. And um, what they were trying to do was cross smallpox with Ebola. And it's because Ebola is, like, seriously fatal, and smallpox is seriously contagious. And so they thought, well, seriously fatal plus seriously contagious, it's like, what could be better than that? Recipe for disaster. Right, right. And so, and you might say, well, is crossing Ebola with smallpox, if, is seeing whether you can cross Ebola with smallpox a reasonable scientific question, an appropriate scientific question? And purely from the perspective of science, yes. Because science is a generic problem-solving mechanism. Now, you might say, well, <laughs> no. It's like it's not something any reasonable human being should ever engage in, but that's not the same thing as asking whether or not it's a question within the reasonable purview of science. I mean, the thing about science is that science was designed to be as value-free a methodology as possible. It's designed for that. And so then people say, well, why is there a gap between science and values? It's like, well, because it's built into the methodology. So it looks to me like you need something that's outside of science to direct the, the ethic. And it seems to me it that that's come something from like stories. Can't well, it can't come from within science. I don't see how. I mean, partly because you exclude the the value. Isn't the story of the cosmos already enough to get someone excited enough to find some sort of value system from the being born from the stars and that being inspirational? No, not necessarily, because you can just as easily say, well, you know, here we are in this little dirt ball in the middle, you know, on the outer edge of this galaxy that's rotating, going to rotate pointlessly for the next 250 million years you know, a, a couple of dozen billion years before the heat death of the universe. It's like, that's pretty dismal accounting of the utility of life. I mean, you know what I mean? You can take... You, sure, so, we're so taking you, it from well, you have that entire Well, you have that entire range of interpretive possibilities from, sure. like, isn't life remarkable and sure. wonderful and to isn't it bloody pointless if you, if you look at it from the wrong temporal I perspective. I think you can find that from science. Well, yeah, but you can also find the reverse. So that's the problem. I'm <clears throat> not anti-scientific. Yeah, yeah, but of course. But I don't, 
I don't see a simple way of solving the problem of, of, of the ethical direction of the scientific in inquiry. I mean, um, you don't. Know, what what comes to mind maybe as a way to to get to that area? Well, one of the things that I talked about in detail with Sam Harris, and we're going to talk about this some more because it's by no means solved, is the relationship between facts and values. And the old idea, Hume's idea, is you can't derive values from a set of facts. And I think that's sort of right, but I do, I kind of think it's more complicated than Hume thought it was, but I'm not exactly sure why. Because like I made a case earlier about this emergent ethic arising out of, out of, out of iterated games. That kind of looks like a scientific observation about the origin of morality. It's something like that. So it's not like science can't inform your moral decisions, but exactly how that might come about is by no means a straightforward issue. And it's I mean, fascinating. Well, it's also not the case. It is also not self-evident that science has served a beneficial function for human beings. Like it might be the case. It could be the case. I mean, look, we're pretty comfortable here, and thank God, and that's definitely a consequence of the scientific revolution. But, but you, you know, just highlighted your phone as a major... Yeah, yeah, but one good hydrogen bomb blown up over North America would set us back about 50,000 years, and that could easily happen. If I was a paranoid dictator, that's certainly what I would do. And I don't, I don't know, you, yeah, you yeah. Guys, most of you guys probably know what would happen if you you'd blow up a hydrogen bomb... I think it's about 150 miles up, something like that. One, you get an electromagnetic pulse, it takes all the electronics out. Like, all of them. Right. One bomb. And so, like, maybe we'll manage that, but it wouldn't... And, you know, maybe we'll manage that transition to whatever we're going to do next, but I wouldn't count on it. And so, it isn't even necessarily the case that scientific endeavor is a pro-human life process. Depends it, on what we do with it, I it, suppose. And that's why you said earlier that it's important now more than ever to have these conversations about the future of humanity and where are we going, how are we going to do this together. So let, let's, let's talk about just ending it off with mutual exploration. I really thought this was interesting. And the intellectual dark web is a really good example of this, which you are a main pillar of, uh, in my opinion. So let's say that two people are having a conversation and they're reducing their points they're maybe keeping it to straight binary we see a lot of political polarization that's occurring today in united states politics finding a lot of the beauty and the nuance of conversation when you take complex position and you maybe stay equanimous rather than become agitated um, all of these things tend to drive better conversations. And it seems as though you're leading that forefront. What, what, what do you see in that sort of path that we're walking of figuring out how to have better conversations? There's a, I, I write about this a fair bit in 12 Rules for Life. There's a chapter, I think it's chapter nine. I think that's right. Uh, assume that the person that you're listening to knows something you don't. It's kind of a derivation of some, of some things that I learned from Carl Rogers, who was a great clinician, great 20th century clinician. His star sort of rose during the 1960s. He was a humanist. Um, he was a Christian missionary when he was a kid, but he dropped that, and he, he became a le leading light in humanistic psychology. And he was really interested in the preconditions for therapeutic conversation. Um, and he thought that, well, if, if you were going to engage in the process of therapy with a client that the client had to bring to the session before he or she arrived the willingness to make things better. That would be the first thing. Yeah. Right? So that, and I, I've done therapy that was court mandated. Like, I wouldn't recommend that. That just doesn't work very well. You know, because you can't force someone to be better. They, they have to kind of come already thinking that there's a bunch of things they don't know and that their life could be better than it already is. And that's a good position to take when you're engaging in a conversation with someone. It's like, look, if you already know enough, more power to you, man. You know, but if you're suffering more than you think is necessary, which is like highly probable, or, or more than you think is desirable, which basically means if you're suffering more than you think is desirable, that means that you're way more ignorant than you need to be, 
right? That's what it means because maybe you have an illness, you don't know how to cure it. Yeah. Maybe you're having a fight with someone, you don't know how to get out of it. Maybe you're failing at work and you don't know what to do about it. It's like you're ignorant and, yep, yep. and no wonder because yep. people are ignorant. And so you might think, well, unless everything is just the way you want it to be, then you have something to learn. And then you think, well, maybe the person you're talking to, no matter how uncomfortable you are with their opinions and how bent out of shape you think they are, maybe even how bent out of shape they actually are, there's always the possibility that if you actually engaged in a conversation, you ask them questions and you tried to figure out what they thought, that you'd come away with one crumb of knowledge more than you had when you went into the conversation. And like conversations like that are a lot more interesting. Like I found in my you know, I've probably done 20,000 hours of clinical work, something like that. And so that's 20,000 hours of really, 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 really serious conversations. And they're almost always interesting beyond belief. And like I've had clients that, I, I told you already, that sort of spanned the entire spectrum from people who were so impaired cognitively and behaviorally that while well, they were utterly unemployable by any, any reasonable standards to people who were unbelievably high functioning. And, I found working with all of them, if, I, if I'm in the zone properly, it's ridiculously fascinating yeah. because people are ridiculously interesting. And, yes. so, and, and everyone has their own characteristic experience that's actually unique. And so if you have a real conversation yeah. with someone and they tell you what's unique about their experience, the probability that you can learn something from that is, it's, it's, well, it's, it's certain that you can. My, yeah. my low IQ clients, God, they taught me so much. It's just... For, they taught me how difficult things were first, you know, because to see someone struggle with a task that the typical person can do without even thinking sheds light on exactly how amazing it is that, that normal people can do that and how hard it is when, when you're impaired to the point where those sorts of normal behaviors become, become impossible. It's so enlightening. It teaches you a lot about the world. And so I think part of the reason that YouTube is killing television is partly because it's technologically advantageous. I mean, make no mistake about it. There's nothing that TV yeah. can do that YouTube can't do. And there's a whole bunch of things that YouTube can do that TV can't. So it's obvious which one's going to win. But what's also interesting about it is that there seems to be a massive and relatively untapped market for actual conversation. And it's because conversation is between people of goodwill who are trying to tell the truth, who are trying to aim at making things better, is unbelievably valuable. I mean, at least in principle, that's what we're all doing here, right? I mean, yep. even though, you know, you guys aren't talking, um, that doesn't mean this isn't a conversation. You know, it's, first of all, we're trying to pay attention to you at least enough to see if everyone is engaged in the conversation. If, if you're not engaged in it, then it would be completely pointless, yep. right? And you one involved of the them in your experiment. That was amazing. Well, one That's of the great. things I learned in my clinical practice is that if the conversation wasn't interesting, then I was doing it wrong. Yeah. That's right. It's just... And that's a really cool thing, too. I think that also speaks to this idea of a universal ethic. I've really become interested. I, I talked about this with Ian McGilchrist recently. I just released that video today, though it was up a week ago on a different site. Um, I've really become interested in the idea that the sense of engagement, of meaningful engagement, is the deepest of cognitive instincts. I actually think you can make a very strong neurobiological case for that. And that, that if you're engaged in something, what it means is that you're safe and secure, on the one hand, sufficiently safe and secure. You're in your domain of competence, which is a good place to be. You know, it's like explored territory. So you're with, within the walls where you're safe, but you're also peering over the fence at mm -hmm. the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're engaged, what it means is that you're in your domain of competence, but you're operating within that domain of competence so that you're expanding your competence at the same time. And so you feel that as meaningfully, engage, meaningfully engaging, Flow. and it is. And so, Flow and I state. do also think that that sense of meaningful engagement is the right antidote to the suffering that's that's, that's part and parcel of our limited existence. It's like you need an antidote to the fact that life is suffering. And the, the experience of meaningful engagement, I think, is that antidote. And I also mm -hmm. think that the experience of meaningful engagement is a marker that you're where you should be, doing what you should be at the right time. Yeah. I think it's the deepest of cognitive instincts. Yes. And so that's really cool, man, if that was true. I think it's actually true. 
So it'd be really something if that was yeah. true, man. So, but I think it is. So when we we're can in try that, state, that and see if it works. In that state of flow, you lose a sense of time. Yeah, well, you lose your self-consciousness yep. too as well. Yep, so, yep. And that's something that's worth thinking about. I would also consider that a primary religious experience. It's something like that. Yeah. You know, you were talking about science and religion earlier, and like, there's a bunch of questions that we need to address pretty seriously about that too, because the, the scientific, the kind of atheist types, you know, they're very down on the idea of religion. But that's a very bad idea, because religion is a human universal. Right. And yep. religious experience, people have religious experiences. It's like, at minimum, we need an explanation for that. Plus, you can induce them, which is also, you, you know, you can't, you can't just write that off. Like, you can induce religious experiences. Well, that like, can be what intertwined the hell's up with, with that? spiritual as well, right? Yeah. R religious, spiritual. So, but it's, it's, not, it's not just conceptual. Like, you know, you can say, well, course. there's a spiritual yeah, yeah. realm. It's deeply experiential. It has to be, so, yeah. It, Jordan... Are we in a computer simulation? Uh, <laughs> um, if we are, it's within a computer that we don't understand. Um, I, I look, I th questions like that are, are strange because... Um, <laughs> Welcome to simulation. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's, like, it's, it's like asking whether you can reduce consciousness to material, to, to its material substrate. And the answer to that is yes, but... By the time we reduce consciousness to its material substrate, our understanding of what that material substrate is will have transformed so dramatically that it won't look very much like the material substrate that we presume now. And so if we're in a simulation, then it's within the confines of a mechanism that we can't easily assimilate to our own computational devices. So it's... it's it, and then, of course, the other problem with a question like that is, well... We've already defined this as reality, and so is reality a simulation? It's, well, no, by definition, it's not. It's, you might say, well, a simulation can get so real that you can't distinguish it from reality, but you start to... Almost all questions of the form, is A, B, devolve down to, it depends on how you define A and B. Because the problem with questions like that is it decontextualizes the terms, right? It's like, well, what do you mean by reality? What do you mean by simulation? Well, if you mean the same thing by both of them, then they're the same thing. If you mean different things by both of them, then they're different things. And so, well, but, but I'm serious, yeah, I'm serious about that. You know, mo most of the time you can't pull single terms out of a conversational stream and assume that the, the term has a bounded definition that's self-evident using only that term. Because when we converse, it's like, well, you utter a stream of words. It's like, well, what do the words mean? Well, it depends on where they are in the phrase. It depends on where they are in the sentence. It depends on where the sentence is located in the paragraph. It depends on the context within which the paragraph is uttered. And you, you triangulate all of that simultaneously to extract out the meaning of the word. And then if you take a word out like it's a thing and another word out like it's a thing and you say, are these two things the same? You're acting as if those words can be decontextualized and they have absolute meaning in, in their decontextualized state, and they don't. So, so, so usually those questions, I would say, in some sense are philosophically, are, are philosophically untenable. So, so, well, that's the answer to that that's question. That's the answer to that. <laughs> For those of you that haven't done uh, self-authoring or understand myself, they're incredible programs. There's a 20% off code. It's Sanfran. So give that a go. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate you. I appreciate you coming out here. And San Francisco Bay Area, really enjoyed having you. We hope to have you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jordan. Thank you, everyone. That was very much fun. Yep. Let's get him. V.